So, well, thanks for coming first. Uh, so this is a project I've been mulling over and really thinking about, thinking about for several years now, in fact. Uh, but only started uh, recently on, on free time, and so I thought maybe it was time to get some feedback about it, maybe. So constructive criticism, uh, tell me about blind spots, uh, and what do you think of, of, of the idea. So it all starts with um, what it looks like to read articles today. So when I read a PDF right now, In my field, I look for references, and for each of the references I see, I have to scroll all the way down to the bottom of the article, copy paste the title of the citation into Google Scholar. So you can see that on the top part. And it's a really uh, tedious work, really. It's full of uh, roadblocks basically to your, your uh, reading stuff. So, and if you compare that to, um, say, for instance, when you're reading on Wikipedia, uh, where every citation to another article is a link, you get uh, direct previews of every citation that's in the article instantaneously uh, with the little picture or with the abstract, and you're just a click away from the content that you need. Whereas up there, this is the first citation that I'm opening, and I don't even know if I have access yet. Okay, good news, I do have access. So how, how, how come we're stuck with this? How come we're reading PDFs? How come we're sending PDFs to each other? Why are we not reading a wiki? And science should be a wiki. It's basically citations. And how come we're not reading, reading wikis? Really? Um, well, to be absolutely honest, in fact, we're not completely stuck. Um, there are a lot of better ways of reading research today, mostly using um, the platforms of the publication houses. So, for instance, if you use Science Direct, whenever you click on a citation link, you'll get the title, and you get a link to a Google Scholar search for that article. If you read on PNAS, you get the title just by hovering over the citations, and you get a link to Google Scholar. But these things are still siloed in each different publication house. And what they're doing is they're just outsourcing the inter-platform um, links to Google Scholar instead of consuming directly the information that Google Scholar could give them and creating actual wiki-like links between the citations. Now, why do they do that? Because it's not a reliable art to link between articles because you have to extract structured information of the citation from PDFs. I'll come back to that later. Uh, other platforms, such as eLife, and just still have taken things a notch further in, in terms of uh, web publishing. So eLife, they add over all their publications a, an annotation interface, which is based on a platform called Hypothesis. We'll come back to that later, too, where you can select pieces of text and add annotations that are then publicly shareable uh, to other communities independently of the fact that the annotations were originally made on ELA. Uh, you can use the content you annotated, you can share it to uh, other websites and you can appear for people coming from other websites. Uh, Distill really is kind of state of the art in terms of uh, using the capacities of the browser for uh, explorable explanations. Uh, so this is all uh, standard publication on this tool is JavaScript in the browser using TensorFlow.js and they do a lot of deep neural network uh, explanations using implementations of uh, models directly in the browser that you can explore and type into. So this, this is, I actually typed that and filmed it. But all these things are um, kind of isolated improvements to uh, the current state of reading PDFs mostly. Um, there's also a, a, another avenue that I'll talk about later, which is uh, extracting structured information from PDFs, uh, such as what um, ResearchGate does, for instance. So if you download uh, an article that's hosted by ResearchGate, usually the references at the bottom are in fact links to other articles that are also hosted by ResearchGate. 
And they do that using a library called Groby and Shopping Max Maker. Now, these two things, having to read PDFs all the time, the isolated improvements that we're seeing, to me, are really symptoms of a lack of standards in the way that we exchange scientific content, research output, basically. It's not a lack of available standards. There's lots of possible standards that you could use. It's, it's a lack of what we're using as a standard. Just currently, we're using PDF. And PDF is, is really like, it's, it's a picture on screen. And it's an encoding of just words with a formatting of the words, so italics, the size of the font, etc., and a position on a canvas to make sure that the document appears exactly the same on any device in which you read, it, and that's all. But other than that, it's flat information, so it's really difficult to extract from a PDF who are the authors, who are their, what are their affiliations, uh, what are the authors' emails, and the, even the title of the PDF, the title of the subsections, the, the contents of each subsect, subsection, uh, the footnotes, etc., etc. Um, whereas the content that we're actually publishing is extremely structured, is extremely codified. There's always an abstract, there's always an author, and we completely use that information when we exchange those PDFs. There's a number of other symptoms of this lack of standards, and one of them is what's happening for annotations. So you can annotate PDFs, uh, you reader, whatever, highlights. Uh, lines, polygons, whatever. But it stays in the PDF. If you want to share it with someone else, you either send a PDF or you extract it using Mendeley or Zotero. It's not very easy. Contrast that with, with what's happening on the web, where you can take any web page, so this is a browsing web page, and click a bookmark, which is the hypothesis bookmark, I was uh, the platform I was talking about earlier on. It imports a bunch of JavaScript into the page and shows you annotations that are hosted on a different platform, and that you can add to for any web page. So you can now, once I have imported this JavaScript, this little piece of interface, I can select text here and add a, an annotation, or which I can then choose to share publicly, or to a subgroup, or just keep private. And you can have conversation threads around the annotations, where each annotation is, in fact, a fully web capable. Piece of content, so you can have animations, videos, etc. Et and this is really the kind of, of overlay that you would like to have on top of scientific research, where you can have conversations that are independent of the platform on which things are published, and which would give you a, a, a strong level of reflexivity on top of research outputs. <coughs> That's absolutely not possible today with, with um, BDN. Another symptom is the state of bibliographic search. Um, Today, the best option you have to do a, a very a relatively uh, fine-tuned search is the, the advanced Google Scholar search, uh, at least to the extent of my knowledge. And you can do lots of things with that. You can search for a subset of, key, of keywords that should appear uh, in your article. You can search for articles that are authored by X, Y, Z, etc. But you can't search over the citation graph directly. You can't say, I want the uh, N article um, that is aware of results X, Y, Z. I have these three articles that are interesting to me, and I want all the articles that cite those three articles. You can only do that approximately through a text-based search. You can't do that directly on the citation graph. Uh, more generally, you don't have um, support for navigating communities. So if, you, if I don't know if you've had that experience, but when you're entering a new area that you want to rely on, or if you want to contribute to that area, uh, often you don't know the exact keywords that the community uses. And you spend a lot of time doing searches and not finding very interesting things. And what happens usually is you work in on that area for a couple of weeks or even more months, and you eventually find out the proper keywords that you should have used to find the good pieces of content after the fact. Uh, I call that the unknown keyword problem. And the, Currently, no search tool solves that for me. <laughs> and it, it's really what, what you really want when you're doing a search is, in fact, give me the review article that the competent person person would give me for this query. And, and no search tool gives you that. And currently, starting a bibliographic search tool has the very 
high cost of having to process PDFs and having to extract all the structured information from the PDFs in order to uh, look at the citation graph in order to uh, have keyword search on full text content. So this is another symptom of uh, the, 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 this lack of competition and the lack of improvement of the bibliographic search tools is another symptom of the lack of standards uh, in, in the con this format for exchanging scientific information. Um, another point which is a kind of a, of a nice symptom really is that there's a, a huge constellation of innovations that are appearing around what could be the future of scientific publications. So uh, Jupyter Notebooks, for instance, or Anodide Notebooks, which are a, a more portable version of uh, the idea of a notebook, where you can embed directly JavaScript uh, and, and different languages in, in the same plain text uh, source, are becoming very popular as a means of exchanging intermediary results. And gradually, there's this idea that uh, we could uh, have publications based on notebooks. That could be a possibility. Just imagine the idea that also blog posts could be converted gradually into publications if you just acquire a, document, a digital object identifier for the blog post and have a proper peer review on it. Uh, you could have interfaces uh, or, or um, interfaces that create a kind of interaction like Stack Overflow, where you're encouraged to have uh, questions and answers, or in this case, articles and reviews, which are reviews particularly also upvoted and not only articles. And in most of these cases, what you would have is, in fact, a post-publication peer review. So there's no barrier anymore to publication, but there is a barrier or a, a competition for acquiring attention to the content you publish freely and acquiring positive uh, reviews for that content. Um, a final thing you, could, you can think about are wiki pages as, as publications. So that happens in, in Scholarpedia, where basically it's a wiki where every page is a peer-reviewed article uh, with invited authors. Now, that's one step in using the idea of a wiki. A further step is the idea of allowing um, authorship to be more fluid, as is the case currently in Wikipedia. Uh, if, if you look at the history of edits on Wikipedia pages, you see that uh, they're the result of, of a very broad number of edits and a broad number of uh, fields of, of, from the people coming to edit, in fact. This is currently not possible today. If, if you want, if, for instance, you're a statistician and you want to contribute to a field, your skills, you want to correct the, statistic, the statistical methodology of an article, the only way you have to do that is to create a full-fledged relationship with people in that field and then publish an article with those people. Now, what Wikipedia does for you uh, in the Wikipedia space is it manages that relationship and it allows people to do a very targeted contribution, fixing errors for which they are experts without having to create a relationship with the other co-authors of that article. So that kind of blurs the lines of who is the author of the article, but it makes for a much increased quality in the overall uh, system because everybody can do very targeted small contributions without having to be an expert in the area in which they're making of the article over which they're making the contribution. Now, currently, all these ideas are uh, floating around, and we have on the other side institutional publication with PDFs. And what we would really like is a way to integrate all these things without having any cost to navigation, uh, navigating between each format and not having any cost to publishing under any format. You would be able, uh, I, I, we would ideally like to be able to uh, read an article that is published as a Jupyter notebook or, or a blog post and navigate freely to an article that has originally been published as a PDF in 1980, and, or navigate from a PDF to an article uh, that's a week on Scholarpedia, etc. I have them all read through a common interface independently of the original platform or the original format under which it was published. Now, as long as we're stuck with PDF, um, we're stuck with a, a, a incompressible editorship work to extract the structured information from the PDFs in order to integrate with these other types of uh, kind of scientific conversation that could happen in the future. And so this brings us to 
where PDFs are owned. So you probably know about this. Uh, there is four or five, sometimes you can count up to six uh, major publishing houses. Uh, the first four are Reed Elsevier, Wiley, uh, Taylor and Francis, and Spring and Nature, uh, which, depending on the area, on, on, the, on the field, uh, own 20 up to 70% of research output. So they have the copyright, they own the content. Um, and there's a bunch of problems associated to that. So Timothy Gallagher is a, a metal field in the UK who really describes this problem pretty well. So I'm just going to read what he says. Something is deeply wrong with the current system of academic publishing. The basic point which has been made by innumerable, made innumerable times by innumerable people, sorry, is that the really hard parts, the writing of papers and the peer review and selection of the ones to publish, are done voluntarily by academics, and modern technology makes things like typesetting and dissemination extremely cheap. And yet publishers are making more money than ever before. So on the right hand side, you have the prices that UK universities have been paying to Elsevier for access to Science Direct in 2014. Now the interesting thing is, apart from the size, the, so the prices here, is that this information was only obtained through concerned citizens who made requests legal requests to obtain that information, because under the terms of the contracts that Elsevier has with those universities, the universities aren't allowed to communicate the prices, because Elsevier doesn't want them to, to talk to the industry. Um, and this grows gradually every year, basically. Um, so we're in a situation where these, these big publishing houses are in fact sitting on a gold mine of legitimacy. The idea that it, if you want your career to advance, you need to publish in high impact factor journals, which are mostly owned by um, these big publishing houses. And it's very difficult to move to different journals. So you keep publishing there. And we're in a situation where the state funds research. It pays these companies for publishing the output of the research. And it pays these companies again for reading the output of research that it funded and that it paid for publishing. So basically, every interaction you have with these companies is charged. And the only value they add to the process is typesetting, proofreading, posting, which is definitely not worth those prices. Now, things are changing. So, for instance, in France, you don't have access anymore uh, to Springer publications since last year, um, because the consortium that's doing the negotiation with Springer decided not to renew the contract. Um, in Germany, a number of universities have also decided to stop renewing contracts with Springer. Uh, there's many communities, spe specifically in mathematics, they're moving away from Elsevier quite strongly. But things are going very slowly still because they're sitting on this gold line of legitimacy of, of different journals. Now this, if you combine it with the lack of, symptom, the lack of um, standards, are in turn symptoms of a lack of global governance. You can think of science as a um, as a commons. A commons is usually defined as a, as a resource which can be material or informational, where there's users of the resource, there's producers of the resource, produce the resource, and there is a governance body which makes sure that the resource is uh, managed in a sustainable way in the long term, and that all the readers who want access do have access, that all the producers that should produce do produce and uh, that uh, the quality is maintained over the long term. Now, science, you can look at through this lens. There is readers, there's producers. Most producers are also readers, but there's no global or federated governance over how scientific conversation should happen or the format it should take or how it should be hosted. Um, there's other symptoms of, of this lack of, of governance. Uh, one is related to the bibliographic search problem, is the barriers to cross-community uh, work. So this unknown keyword problem is really, so this is an example in my field, where there's this concept of interactive alignment, uh, which is the idea that over a period of time, when people communicate, uh, two people communicate with, with each other, um, they develop a set of, of uh, private uh, understanding of each other. So they, they, they assign a certain meaning to certain signs or to certain movements or to certain interactive moves, which really depends 
uh, crucially on the history of the order of interaction, it's really contingent on that, and it, um, it, it is extremely private to the, the history of the interaction between those people. And the keyword is interactive alignment. Now, if you don't know the keyword, there's no way you can guess that. If you were thinking about those ideas, and oh, right, the history of my interaction with Mikhail could have an impact on the meaning that we have and we exchange, well, I would look for the evolution of our private language depending on the context of interaction. And if you search for that, you find nothing related to interactive alignment. This means that, as I said before, when you're exploring a new area, you have a very high cost of finding the right keywords. The second problem, which I was talking about well, in the case of the wiki authorship, is if you want to contribute to an area that is not yours, the current way of doing it is the only option you have is to create a relationship with experts in that area and do a publication with them. If you want to improve the statistical methodology of cognitive science papers, for instance, the only way you have is to partner with some science. You can't just go and try and improve this, the methodology based on the data that's available in the articles. Um, Cross-community work for communities that are not identified as a, a core interdisciplinary area that is funded specifically is also generally disincentivized, and not consciously, no, not intentionally, I would say. But um, since if, from the moment you're uh, serious about getting a, a stable position in academia, uh, you have to fit somehow your profile to university departments, which follow traditional disciplinary boundaries. And if you're spending time doing cross-community work, if you're doing uh, work, uh, half your time you're doing in one community and half your time you're doing in the other community, it's as if you're working half time for your target recruitment department, basically. So there's no real, there's, there's kind of a disincentive really to uh, doing interdisciplinary work in a field that hasn't been recognized as such. Which brings us to the incentives for the content uh, that is being pro produced. Um, this is a really important point, I find, um, which, is, which I don't see discussed much. So on one side, you have the incentives for research output. Today, it's pretty difficult to publish negative results. If you, you start on a project that doesn't work out, you're going to have a hard time publishing the fact that it didn't work. On the opposite side, it's pretty difficult to publish um, a reproduction of an existing piece of work if, it's, if it worked. If it didn't work, you can always say, well, oh, right, that, that's interesting. Uh, this published work is not reproducible. But if it did work, in fact, you're contributing to the robustness of that result, but it's very difficult to publish unless you're in a, a wide... Uh, endeavor to validate a lot of publications as exist today in, in psychology. Um, but the, the result of this is that no negative results means there's an amnesia to failed attempts. So we're probably all trying things that other people have tried, and we don't know if they failed or not. And um, there is a, a tolerance to very brittle results because of its difficulty to publish positive reproductions. Now, if you combine that with the situation for staff recruitment, where there's an increasing demand because the number of graduating PhDs is increasing over time, whereas the general investment in stable positions is not increasing that fast, if increasing at all, it means that researchers that are not stable in academia yet are making all decisions in a situation of under risk, meaning that you're going to think very hard and long about what type of project you're going to work on because you wanted to have a return on investment quickly. And you don't want to, to, you're going to be very conservative in the choices you make of the types of projects that you're going to work on. You want to make sure that you're going to be able to publish something in a few months, in a year, in two years. You're not going to invest time in a very risky project. The increasing demand and the kind of constant investment in, in staff recruitment also means that um, metrics are being used more and more for filtering initial uh, applications, which eventually turn metrics as goals in themselves. So you, what you want to do is publish in high impact factor journals. And that can become part of your goal for research, which is a big problem. And also incentivizes a short term vision in projects generally. So because impact factor is the way it is, it measures the average number of citations that a journal receives, uh, an, art an article receives when it is published in journal X in the two years following its publication. So it's an explicitly short-term vision of uh, the value 
of an article, the value of a journal, generally, for its article. If you combine that with, with the idea that we're um, constantly doing decisions under risk, that you don't want to invest too much time in a project that has high risk, you're in fact incentivizing projects that have a short-term vision, a short-term return on, on investment, and, uh, and generally a culture of low-hanging fruits. I, I've realized that I'm trained to recognize in problems everything that can be done easily in a couple of months, instead of going for the root of the problem that could really take a long time to identify, but wouldn't get me anywhere in terms of career. Side effect of that is we keep reading the same ideas over and over in different articles, dilution of ideas, because if you have an idea and you can publish aspects of that idea in two, three, maybe four articles, then you're gaining more points in metrics. So it's really a big waste of, of time, of energy, and more importantly, of ambition in terms of what you want for your own research. So this is starting to look like a bit of a nasty beast. <laughs> so where do we start? In fact, many, many people have already started on this. So there's a gazillion existing initiatives around this. And the project I'm, I'm putting forward here is not another silver bullet. It's explicitly not that. The idea is to try and bridge together existing things. So the idea is pretty simple, in fact. It's just to start with the reading interface that we have every day. So it's to propose an interface that presents article, articles as if they were part of the wiki. You have a web page where you drag and drop a PDF and processes it, or some machinery processes it. And you can read the article as if it were a wiki page. And every citation in the article is a link to another article which can be read on the same platform. So starting with the first PDF you put in this interface, you can navigate all the pre-processed articles through this interface, jumping from link to link. So it's, by, it's powered by a, some kind of background PDF processing. I'll come back to that in the next slide. And as the PDFs are being processed, the results are stored in a permanent distributed database. The result of the processing of, of, all, the, of all the PDFs, so the structured information, is made available when it's legal to be made available. That's an important part of it. Meaning that uh, we're creating gradually the database that's necessary for a bunch of things to be bridged together. I'll come back to that later. This is the, the, the idea behind this Wikilike article mm -hmm. reader is, is really to, cre to create a first interface that gives you support for the ideation process when you're reading. So when you're reading, there's all these roadblocks you have to copy and paste names of articles to see if you have access, etc. Et and this is really slowing you down in all the ideas that come to mind when you're reading. You can think of reading an article as you're trying to ingest, to, to infer, in fact, the structure that the original authors had to uh, compress into a linearized stream of words. And what you're doing is trying to infer, again, the structure of the ideas that are put in these words. Now, if you have an interface that helps you do that, or gives you access to what other people saw in an article, an, a, a point of view, a, 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 an inferred structure of the article, things could be a lot easier and a lot more productive in terms of ideas. Now, in terms of PDF processing, there's a number of options, and I have two constraints for the project. One, uh, the project shouldn't be paying for the processing power of existing PDFs, so it has to be done in the browser. And two, I want to grow a community around this because of support for this project. And there's a number of existing options for, well, there's, a, there's one real existing option for PDF processing, which is, which is a library called Gobi, which is developed by people in Nadia uh, in fact, which is already very widespread uh, in a lot of services. So ResearchGate uses it, HAL uses it, uh, probably Google Scholar uses it, use it also. So it's a Java library, a machine learning library, and, and an associated web server. Um, which munches PDFs and spits out structured information in a format called Text Encoding Initiative. And it gives you the full text, it gives you the citations, it gives you the author affiliations, the authors, and the footnotes. It, it, does, basically, it does the work, basically. Um, but it also has a number of problems. The first is uh, trying to convert that to the browser has been problematic. So I tried that using Google Web Toolkit or other tools to translate Java to JavaScript. 
And the problem is that um, Grovid relies on a C program, which is PDF to text, to do the initial extraction of information from PDFs. And without going too much into the gory details, if you try to compile a C program to the browser, so to WebSAM in this case, you have two options. Either you simulate a full normal platform, a full libc, where there's a file system, etc. But this is the, the path taken by a project called mscriptum. And this makes very large binaries. So I don't want to do that. And the other option is to try to trim out all the parts of your program that rely on being on a normal computer. So having a file system, having a normal libc, basically. Get all that out and compile using an experimental target uh, for web assembly uh, using LLVM. The problem with PDF to text is that it's really file based. So you're basically rewriting at least half of the whole program if you want to put it to WebAssembly using that target. And since that target is experimental, you're also having to use many, many hacks in order to uh, link your WebAssembly output to other libraries that you're including in your browser program. I won't get in more into the details, but uh, I tried that option and I failed. <laughs> Another uh, question was um, with this option would have been if there's optimization questions and performance problems, uh, how would that be diagnosed in the generated JavaScript and brought back to Java? And generally, the code of, of Hobie is it, it works very well, but it's very messy also. And, and I'm really not a fan of Java. So I'm deciding to run with Rust for a number of reasons. First, they have an amazing community an amazing community process in how they make the decisions. And there's a very strong momentum around the idea that Rust should be a first class language to write things that then compile to the browser, to WebAssembly. It also allows me, since I'm um, generally, if you have the resources to make your own tool, you should do it because it, then your tool is going to fit exactly to your own problem. In this case, um, we can expand a little bit the scope of the project by allowing to process PDFs that are not what we call linearized. So Groby, since it, it uses PDF to text, will not process properly a PDF that you have edited. For instance, you have a paragraph and you want to add a word in the paragraph. So you add a word at the beginning of the sentence and it, it kind of sticks out the paragraph. But you save it like that and it's readable. Um, for instance, Pre-publication uh, manuscripts could have this kind of artifacts. And this is interesting to be able to process because if we're going to use legal versions of articles, we're going to have a lot of pre-publication versions. And in the case of Gobi, uh, this little word in the encoding of the PDF is in fact going to appear at the end of the stream of bytes in the file encoding. And PDF to text will encode this word at the end of the content instead of recognizing that it's part of the paragraph. Um, in terms of location on the canvas. So this is the kind of problem that I like to attack also in, in, this, uh, in this library. Right, so wh what are the general goals? The idea is, as I said, really not to, to propose a, a new silver bullet saying, well, this is the way scientific conversation should be done. Everybody come and publish on my panel. No. It's really to, to lift a barrier between existing initiatives, to be able to interchange uh, things between existing initiatives a lot more easily. A strong point is that if you start reading using that, your, your research flow is going to be easier from day one. You don't need to change your, your practices in terms of publication or reading, you just you have the capacity suddenly to navigate research as a wiki from link to link. And if you want, you can have a bit of context in uh, how things are shown. So you can have um, the community in which uh, the article appeared. You can have uh, a bit of a timeline. So what, what appeared before, what appeared after in, in the community around that article. You can have generally cognitive support for your reading. And as you use this interface, you're contributing to the processing power to bring all existing scientific, research, uh, scientific output into a permanent web in a structured database. So this is really what's necessary in order to have a, a broader and more reflexive conversation, uh, conversation about the use of metrics and how we have better metrics, how we can make it so metrics don't become goals in themselves, 
how to have an open competition for bibliographic search, so all these problems that I've, I've talked about with the current state of search. It's really also necessary in order to add a layer of shared annotations that you can link to each other. And have a, uh, an additional layer of linked pieces of information of comments on top of our uh, existing research. And more generally, it, it would also very, um, be very interesting to be able to relax the, the formats and the constraints on the types of formats that can enter um, the picture describing the overall contributions of a, of, uh, uh, a researcher. So currently, the formats you have are article, book, conference, proceeding. And there's a lot of debate that happens in workshops or in conferences that are not uh, with proceedings or even blogs that goes unseen in the overall evaluation of what you contribute to research. It would be nice to be able to selectively include these kinds of things and relax the types of formats that underlie, in fact, the, the scientific conversation. So currently all this is, is really uh, an embryonic form. Um, there's a GitHub repository uh, with a library that is able to, to read PDFs in the browser, uh, not much more for now since I haven't had much free time to work on it, but hopefully in the future I'll get uh, maybe full time time to work on it. And, and I'd be very interested in any criticism, ideas, blind spots, I'm not seeing, whatever. Um, thanks for your attention. Thank you. um, right now, uh, all the PDFs we read uh, there are like five, six, seven versions, the uh, post-print, the pre-print, the uh, editor version. How can you, can this system deal with all uh, these differences? Because I, I saw you, you plan to use a, a distributed file system that use uh, ashes to identify uh, content. So how do you plan to deal with papers that are basically the same, but that have different ashes because I don't know, it was, a, it was just an addition of uh, some, uh, some link or something like this. Um, well, the first thing would be to uh, be based on DOIs when they're available. So that would be the first measure. Um, and a second measure, but which is broader maybe than that problem, is uh, a, generally a way for the community to improve um, this, the, the output. So, for instance, there's also going to be problems in automated processing. So, not all PDFs are going to be properly processed, and the interface needs to, to provide a way for you to say, "Ah, now nah, this is not a footnote. <coughs> this is part of the main text. There's an error there." And for the, the algorithm to learn from that in order to improve the processing of future uh, articles, um, I'm not sure how. Uh, Different versions. So, if, if people have different PDFs of, uh, so it, maybe the interface could suggest uh, that there is a strong overlap in terms of content with the PDF that's already been processed and an evaluation of whether it should be the same. That would be an idea. Yeah. Uh, a bit like a more general, like a uh, comment. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, far, far, far away, uh, uh, I was reading like a book, a funny, well, funny, a good book, uh, from Eric Fromm, like uh, To Have or To Be. So it's like contrasting uh, uh, approaches to see the world. Uh, either you see the world like you're possessing something to have, or either you see it as a, like, uh, as a flow, as a creative flow. Uh, so you, you do not uh, make attribution on any single piece uh, of action. So uh, basically, uh, I was reviewing articles now uh, for, I mean, uh, four years, maybe five years for IEEE. Uh, and I see like domination of uh, this, uh, this uh, world vision to have. So people uh, really have this uh, infantile uh, psychology. Uh, as we can like extend it maybe to the world of software. Yeah, we see that uh, Apple, Apple dominates the world now. Uh, so it means it reflects that uh, like, uh, People support uh, 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 support uh, closed sources, mm -hmm. uh, closed sources. They support corporations mm -hmm. in return uh, for uh, belonging uh, to some uh, uh, elitary groups, uh, elitary classes. 
uh, and uh, don't you think that uh, like uh, uh, society is happy what is now and uh, this is sort of uh, imposition Be because from what I see even from reviewing like IEEE articles uh, researchers really 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 they can say that uh, like um, they will not be um, happy if someone like uh, copy it uses some very very basic idea from their article mm -hmm. they use it they will uh, start shouting that they are stealing my research mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it goes very 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 close mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. here everything become like uh, to be mm -hmm. uh, more fluent mm -hmm. and especially narrow field researchers who don't have like vision mm -hmm. they will uh, try to uh, protect their very very narrow visioned world mm. with all their means mm. by suing by releasing like licenses by shouting to everyone another that it's that's my discovery so i've met my personally myself uh, several times uh, this approach and it's from really top uh, of academics i think um i think established researchers might be happy with the current system yeah in, in my experience no one my age or less is happy with the current system. No, um, no, no one who doesn't know, who hasn't fo been forced to adapt to the system, or who didn't get through the net before it became as difficult as it is today, um, is happy with the system. Well, uh, maybe because they don't have uh, permanent positions already. If they were like <laughs> accepted by the system, maybe they become. Uh, System worked for me. Yeah, I was yeah, accepted, yeah, so now problem. I'm happy. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that it's good for the system. I mean, you could you could make it better for everybody. So that's one thing. The second thing is, people are happy, but people could also be happy in a different system. The, um, I I think the main question here is really the incentive for what you do. I mean, if if you get paid good money for uh, if if your work is being reused, then you're going to be happy that your work is reused. Uh, currently, you're not paid good money for that. I, I, like the, I have another example, which is, uh, I was talking about that with a, a colleague who was a postdoc then. Uh, my question was, why is it that in um, natural language processing, most articles don't publish code? They don't publish implementation. So they, they talk about ideas, they describe in algorithmic words their idea, but they never publish code. And there's a lot of uh, under the table kitchen work that goes on in natural language processing. And his answer was, well, I used to publish my code. And when I did that, I suddenly got lots of feature requests of people reading the code, using the code, and saying, well, how can I do x, y, z? Um, could you do this? Could you do that with your, with your method? And he told me, well, I, I'm not paid for that. And I get no reward for doing that. So it's a lot of time taken out of my schedule to do stuff that I'm not incentivized to do. I'm not rewarded for that. And when you think of it, okay, that makes sense. But if you transpose that to, say, books, it's as if a writer was telling you, gosh, it's awful, I'm receiving lots of fan mail from people who want me to go on writing other stories. It, it, I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. It's like the system disincentivizes you to make work that's actually useful to other people. It doesn't pay you for that. Now, if we're able to have a... a Maybe not global, but federated conversation, critical conversation about what are the actual incentives that we want to implement in metrics, in incentive, in recruitment boards, etc. Then you can choose what's being incentivized, and you can choose what makes people happy. Just something to like. Such a system could be useful also, like to decide which kind of situation we are seeing or which kind of citation we are using because right now when you cite some article you don't know if it's just to say uh, well uh, I read this article and it exists or I rely on the result of this article or uh, this article uh, we prove that uh, what we got is like uh, the opposite of what they got and I think it's a problem because uh, you can see on some platform to discuss uh, science sometimes you, you get uh, articles that are very wrong and uh, people just uh, edited the image to 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 to, to make a, to make the point on it's not real science mm -hmm. and any article citing this article might be considered wrong yeah. 
or maybe not because it could be some some another article saying well uh, we we saw this result and we have different results so there is this idea that we we have a web of citation a web of science but it's a very uh very not structured we only have one kind of uh, of interaction between papers on the i think maybe with such a system we could uh, have better like to annotate maybe citation yeah, and say uh, get the context of the paragraph in which something is cited and have search over that. Okay. I think the difficulty you get, for example, just the sentence for the yeah. really just the sentence and the number of the article and you just see if it says like this is the way not to do it or this is the way to do it or it would be very helpful. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah for, for search generally, uh, I, I would love to have, so with this idea of I want papers that cite these two papers, mm. but I also want the interface to give me straight away the sentence in which yeah, it's cited, yeah, exactly. so that I know what yeah. how they relate to it. I wonder if you could comment on how physical printing would fit into this kind of ecosystem, because for me, there's a strong anchor on the use of PDFs and formatting, uh, because eventually we'll want to print out like what we're reading especially the best and like most important papers and not just print it out but to print it beautifully and have it well formatted and, and, and so on uh, so in this kind of ecosystem do you assume that there'll always be uh, this type of data format like PDF that will be um, in part driven by the fact that we'll want it on an A4 page and not just in like a web uh, interface could you comment on there that? could be, there could be. It's, it's even, there's a bit more than that, uh, which is the idea of um, having an editorial line, in fact, in, in a, a cluster of articles. And there's this idea that you, you could say, well, journals are, are really, you, you could do everything on archive and we don't need journals. But there's a kind of duality between so when you do research, you, you sometimes you do it just for, you have an idea that you, you could be passionate about, but you also, it's very productive to have people to talk to that bring you down to actual stuff. And so um, I think it's important not to throw away the idea of, I mean, it wouldn't go in a, away anyway, but it's, it's not a, a good idea to try to I think, criticize that, the idea of having editorial communities and something equivalent to journals with, but not necessarily with the same constraints of, of publication um, in terms of uh, having an, making target audiences exist to talk to them. And in that framework, you could think of um, of clusters of papers that uh, even if they're authored by many people, many different people, and improved over time, uh, could uh, be brought together to make a whole uh, and eventually printed. Right. Okay. Even aesthetically, I think that's, a, that's an important target. Yeah. And I, that, that would be a nice solution to have something dynamic. So uh, so the, the, the PDF, this nice A4 product, um, it, it's not the final product, but something that could be uh, arrived at um, at any point in this stream of mm -hmm. um, collaboration. I think that would be a nice... But I, I think it's also more and more a niche format. Mm. We spend our time in different streams. <laughs> Debatable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a question on in the implementation. So now we have, uh, as I see it, uh, these sort of big piles of papers. Some are freer to access, like archive. Some are not so free to access. And uh, you are you are constructing derivative. Uh, you proposing to construct derivative product over these piles of uh, PDFs. Mm. So, uh, like basic, uh, uh, necessary, not sufficient condition. Necessary condition to succeed, you should have access to. Um, to sufficient amounts of piles to uh, to 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 construct a derivative project over it, and uh, well, see that's the beauty that you don't need that. You can um, like anybody if if you have your own pre-publication uh, 
uh, versions, you just bring them into the interface, mm -hmm. and they're public forever from then on. So it's so I, I don't need like research here. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, but I yeah. mean, uh, uh, the people probably are more interested in already existing research, like uh, terabytes of data, yeah, yeah, yeah. and. Uh, from this point of view, like uh, looking in the past, because you usually we expect uh, to extract. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, like the controllers of big piles. I think they will not be happy. I mean, they will no. not give access. Like also uh, yeah. here, I AAA, they will not give access. They will not speak about. Yeah. And it it, uh, it, it sort of restricts uh, from the beginning. Uh, sort of access to a majority of PDFs available. So in this case, maybe you should uh, go like to creation like of parallel distributed uh, uh, database like Elbakan, like with the SciHub. But then you should go like to in Thailand. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good question, um, but it, I think it's a bit empirical in the end because. There's also a large body of open access articles. Like there's definitely communities that are going to be able to benefit straight away because of the, mm -hmm. all the physics, for instance, is, is that kind of thing. There's communities which are just going to work, work very well straight away. And um, yeah. And also in France, for example, the law uh, yeah. allows you to just put put your preprint or something like this online without having to pay anything. So uh, on most of like the paper online, you, you can share them, not the editor version, but your version, and you can share them after uh, maybe uh, an embargo in time, like six months or one year. Mm. So it will be, it, it's all, most of my research, all I have access is, I just have this uh, Google Scholar button that search on all the personal web page of people, and I just have access to PDF. Mm. And uh, it's not the version, the editor version, but it's okay because I, I have the scientific uh, values, so I have the scientific uh, content of that. Mm. On the yeah, I would uh, comment against it. Like I have my own experience. Like this year, I applied to CNRS, and the comment uh, of uh, like a rejection from the first round uh, was uh, that I was not submit uh, accepted. I did not have like accepted paper to Elsevier. Really? Yeah, I had this comment uh, from uh, Pierre and Paul. Yeah. That uh, the, this was sort of necessary. But the uh, fact that it, it, it wasn't as a beer? No, no, the, the fact that it, it, was, it was not yet accepted. They are reviewing oh. it all one year. Yeah. Okay. So it is submitted uh, still. And uh, this plays very negatively on you. Yeah, so but uh, I mean, it, it's the fact that uh, you, don't, you do not have the result yet. It's not the fact that you publish yeah. after you are accepted a preprint version as you are uh, allowed by the law to, to do so. Wait, I didn't get uh, so. Well, when your paper, I, I, oh, when okay. your paper is accepted, you can put it on your web page, but not the editor version because uh, they, they have made uh, modifications yeah. and they, they put the logo. But you can put what you send to them, the preprint. Yeah. And you can just put it on your web page, and yeah. the other uh -huh. researcher will be very happy because they won't have to, to log in or use SciHub because it's directly available on your web page. But I think your question was also, well, people have to do that. But if you're yeah. saying that, that information is already scraped by the, the add-on you're talking about, then the work is done. Yeah, so there is uh, already some kind of information on there, like platforms like uh, Dissemin, mm -hmm. something like this, that uh, you, you just put your name and they say, well, this paper of you, it's not available online, but you could put it online. Mm -hmm. So uh, just uh, select the PDF on your mm -hmm. computer and just send it, and uh, it will uh, take care of all the yeah, applications. So my comment, uh, like, uh, uh, was uh, like uh, you are saying that yeah it's it you can put it uh, like in many places online available but it will not help you to advance your career yeah but that's I, not the goal was, uh, no, yeah, but it, it, yeah 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 yeah, it's, yeah. It's zero cost oh. yeah yeah but i mean everyone puts an archive uh, yeah. anyway so Thanks again. Thank you.